Hi everyone, when you're building microservices, everything is pretty much an API-based service, and Azure Functions is a perfect tool for building them. On the inbound side, it doesn't matter how your API gets called. It might be behind an Azure front door, an application gateway, an APIM, or another application, but the connection should be made securely. If you're curious how to set this up, you can watch my video on how to authenticate Azure Functions, where I showed two ways to secure the connection. In this video, I will show how to secure the outbound side. So in the next few minutes, we will set up Azure Functions, SQL Database, and Managed Identity. If you have questions, please let me know in the comments. This diagram shows a microservice that we're building, and it's basically a CRUD API. As is typical for most databases, SQL Server needs a login and a password. But for obvious reasons, we don't want to embed the login credentials in our source code. A common solution is to move the credentials out of the source code and into a key vault, and we could do that here, as I showed in my Secure Your Secrets video. However, I want to show you a way to completely remove the need to manage the credentials in Azure. And that is where Managed Identity comes in. With Managed Identity, Azure will manage the entire certificate lifecycle for you. Once you've set it up, you can grant SQL privileges to the function identity. Only applications with that identity will be able to transact with the database. In this way, you let Azure AD, or Azure Active Directory, handle the security of your application for you, leaving you with more time to focus on your app logic. Our setup will need a SQL Server and two functions. We'll first create a SQL Server, and while that's getting set up, we'll switch to creating the Azure functions. Once they're set up, we'll assign each of them a managed identity and log into the SQL Server to grant the read-write access to the functions. Notice that the username for the grant will be the same as the Azure function name. Let's create the SQL Server first. This is going to be the database name. We'll create a new server. Let's set the admin user here. And we're going to pick the serverless option here. Okay, while that's being created, now we're going to go create our Azure functions. We'll start with the Python one first. We'll pick Python as our stack and serverless. Now let's create our C sharp function. .NET. Now over here on the right, we can see that all three deployments are currently running. As soon as our two functions are finished, we're going to go set up their managed identities. This is the Python one. Managed identity just means going to that blade and turning it on. Now the C sharp will set up its identity. Looks like the SQL Server just finished, and we're going to go there and set it up. Go to its identity, turn it on, save it. Now we're going to poke a hole in the firewall so that we can get access to it. And we also have to turn on allow Azure services and resources to access this server. Now that those are in place, I should be able to grant uh, privileges to the SQL Server. For this, I'm going to switch accounts. All right, so now let's access the SQL database. I'm going to use the admin account. And those are the, all the statements that I need in order to grant it access. Now, while we're here, let's go create the database table. And that table has been created. OK, now that the managed identity has been set up, now we can move on to creating the table and the data bindings. We just did the table, so now we're going to move on to the data bindings. If you were writing an API without any frameworks, you would have needed to think about every aspect of the code, including finding the libraries you need to access the database, as well as all the error handling logic, such as retries and timeouts. But we're using Azure Functions, which have a lot of time-saving features built in. What that means is that reading, 
and writing the data is already done for you outside of your code base. In order to make use of this built-in logic, we need to configure it. First up on the left is how your function gets invoked, the trigger. The trigger binding tells the framework when to execute your code. Now there are a lot of bindings to choose from, but for our API, we only really need to think about the HTTP trigger. Specifically to the HTTP trigger, the next thing to look at is the authentication for your function. In our case, this will be anonymous, which means that no checks will be done on the caller. Once the caller is authenticated, the framework looks at the route. <clears throat> the route specifies not only the URL path for calling the function, but a list of parameters that will be pulled from the URL. These parameters can be used later in your code or in the data bindings, which will read and write data for your source. In this case, the ID parameter that was pulled from the URL is being used as part of the SQL statement to filter the data. Depending on your schema, you can customize this to suit your needs. It's also possible to call a stored procedure if it makes more sense. The database connection string parameter here is actually the name of the setting that contains the SQL connection string, which will be stored in the application configuration. As a best practice, you should actually move the setting into a key vault, which will encrypt it as a secret. Finally, the output binding allows you to specify where the data will be stored. This binding will perform an upsert operation and either insert the record or update the record. Depending on the match on the table's primary key and the data you provide, the SQL extension will figure out how to make sure that the data is persisted. If you need to write to multiple tables, you can add multiple output bindings. Again, it really depends on your database schema. As with the input binding, the connection string setting is the name of the setting configuration. Since the framework handles the invocation, the reading of the data, and the writing of the data, your code really becomes much simpler, letting you focus on error checking and transforming of your data. In this way, we can see that our CRUD APIs will either need an input binding or an output binding. Create will need an output binding, read will need an input binding, update will need an output binding, and for delete, I'm just going to use an input binding with the delete statement but it would have been just as easy to call a stored procedure to perform the delete. Okay, so these are our triggers and our data bindings for our API solution. Notice that the SQL connection string is repeated in every binding. So it's important that they are all spelled the same. As I mentioned earlier, this setting would be an ideal candidate to move to the key vault, which would also make it easy to encapsulate development and production differences. OK, so now let's take a look at all of this in the code. Um, for Python, there's a couple of things I had to do in order to get it all working. I had to define two configuration variables, isolate worker dependencies, and the SQL connection string. SQL connection string, there's nothing uh, out of the ordinary for that. But the isolate worker deficient uh, dependencies, this is, I think, part of a preview release. So you have to do this now. In the future, it'll probably go away. Um, for requirements.txt, I had to use version 11.3b1. Um, and in my host.json, I had to specify the preview version of the extension. Uh, and currently, it was only deployed in central US. Uh, so my Python function was able to work with all of these changes. Note the authentication parameter here is set to managed identity. This is actually what allows us to remove the login and password from our code base entirely. For C sharp, um, the same connection string I use identically, I just copied and pasted it. Um, I had to add this uh, .NET package, again, the pre-release version of it, in the same region. Um, and if you look at the code uh, between Python and C Sharp, uh, as aside from the obvious differences between the languages, right? Um, really, the, the only difference you have to really think about is that in Python, your function.json is where you define your bindings. But in C Sharp, you're doing it right in the function itself. In fact, when you compile your C Sharp, it generates the function.json for you. So it's still there, but it's generated from the C Sharp. <clears throat> but aside from that, uh, I think the Python, personally, I think Python is a lot easier to read. Um, but uh, they essentially do the same things. All right, now let's take a look at the actual code. <clears throat> So in Python, I've got my create, delete, uh, get, and update. So create is basically just reading the request body itself. Um, and then it's uh, defining this object uh, where 
you know, behind the scenes of Azure Functions does all of its work. Um, let's compare the same function in um, C Sharp. C Sharp, exactly the same thing. I've got this request, um, and I'm reading the body from the request, converting it to a to this uh, item, which is defined up here. Um, and then I'm basically adding it to this items, which is a uh, collector, right? Um, and um, and I flush it and I exit. That's really it. So again, this is what I this is what I mean to say is that Azure Functions does all the work of reading and writing, and all you're really doing is transforming the data. In both of these scenarios, I'm really not doing very much in terms of transforming. But let's go uh, let's go test it because actually, despite the the simplicity here, um, this is really it. This is this is all you really need to do that simple API. Um, all right, so let's. Let's come into our function. So let's look at Python. Look at the configuration. Configuration is uh, these two parameters are defined. So there's a SQL connection string. That's the cut and paste of pretty much what you saw earlier. Um, and there's my other Python isolate worker dependency set to one. Um, that's all that it was. Now let's take a look at the functions. So we're going to create an item. Let's test it. Now, pre-existing, I already have two items in here, this 123123 and ASD, ASD. Um, we're going to create a new one. So we're going to pass in an object. And the value is junk there. Uh, I'm going to actually, let's make this something more. 987654321. That's been inserted. I'm going to copy that ID because uh, I will update it in a little bit. Let's go to our... Uh, SQL editor and run the select star from demo. And I see that 987654321 junk has been added. And I will now <clears throat> do a uh, get on the same item. And, and I and it, it, this already fills in a query parameter ID. And I'll show you where that comes from. So if I run that, I will get back the data, which is should say junk. So there it is, data one is junk. The way it knew about that ID is actually in function.json. Function.json, I have a route of get item slash ID. And so based on this, it knew that it needed to get that ID parameter. And subsequently, I use it uh, in my select statement. But it knew that it needed it based off that route, which is why the, the browser asked me for it. Let's update CRU. So let's update the item. Same ID. not junk. Let's run that. And we can check it by doing a select. And we should see it should say uh, not junk. That's been updated. Now let's go and do the delete. Here's my delete. I'm just going to delete that ID. And I get nothing back. Let's say I update this. There's three rows here. If I run it again, there should be two. There are two. The not junk is gone. Uh, I forgot to show how that upsert was defined. And uh, the neat thing about it is actually that upsert and insert are identical. And the difference is the data that's coming in. If I look at function.json, this, this basically is it. Item SQL out. The command text is dbo.demo. That's it. There's nothing here to, to, to define that it's an update. This is the what the Azure function does behind the scenes. It checks the primary keys, it compares that with the data that I passed in, and then it decides whether it's inserting or updating. Um, okay, so that's all four operations on the Python side. Let's do exactly the same thing on the C sharp. Uh, C sharp configuration is very similar here. We have uh, defined the SQL connection string. I, as I said, this is identical to before. Um, I did need to grant those privileges. Just those three command lines I ran again uh, with the updated uh, name. And, and that uh, was all that I was needed to, in order to give the managed identity. So here, let's look at create. And we'll pick something A, B, C, D, E, F this time. Cats and dogs. Check the database. And now I have a record for cats with ABCDEF. Let's do a uh, read. 
I got cats back. Um, let's go do an update. ID. A, B, C, D, E, F. And I'm going to pass in dogs, not cats. And that's finished. Let's run this query to see if it said cats or dogs. Nope, it says dogs. Uh, and now we can clean up after ourselves by doing a delete. A, B, C, D, E, F. And we run it. No content. Let's refresh this. Those and that record is gone. So that was a very quick, uh, brief demo from uh, of a CRUD API that was created with both Python and C Sharp, uh, and we use managed identity. Thank you, and uh, we'll see you on the next video.